Morning, Ian. Okay, I'll be better when the when the pub's open. But uh, yeah, hey, strange, strange times. But uh, you know, at least we're able to do what we're doing and, and keep on campaigning. Absolutely. Well, I think most people are aware um, of, of of you and I and, and our roles in the industry and what we're doing, and we'll 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 get on to more of that later. Um, I think what we're going to do in terms of an agenda is is look at three things, and then we've got some member questions. So one of those is really, I think, it's really important for people to understand what was going on in the industry when the code was introduced and a lot of people forget that or don't know and of course you were in a prime place you're an mp at the time you were the main driver behind it so we'll have a little chat about that if that's okay then maybe look at what's happened with the code and the regulator in the four years since it was introduced and then I think it's worthwhile us both explaining. We've both taken probably more decisive action now in terms of setting up organisations to really try and make some changes and really make a difference. So we can both talk about that. And then we'll hand over to uh, to Dave Mountford. I think we'll trust Dave to ask us. We've got a few questions that have come in from people um, and he can ask us those if that's OK. Yeah, that sounds good. Lovely. So, I mean, the first thing, and, and, and it's, I've always found it very interesting, I'm sure others will, you were there at the start. So what really happened, you know, what was it about the industry and the way tenants and the pub operating companies, what was going on with them in particular, that led to the introduction of, of, of the code? I think it was, and I think it's fair to say a lot of people didn't think it had get the vote to get through. What happened there? And what do you think Parliament's intention was for that that code and the regulator? Because I think that's a good place to start. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a long story, but it, yeah. I mean, in very simple terms, I think I probably came to this like a lot of people who care about pubs because I started to wonder why pubs were closing and these toilet boards were appearing. And this was probably even back before I was an MP. And then you start to hear about these big companies and the you know the, the what happened after the beer orders this in these enormous property companies forming not brewing beer in in several cases and yet owning pubs um and selling their own licensees their own supposed business partners um beer at inflated profits as as as, y- as your members many of your members know yeah. um, and i think as that got worse as the obviously there was the property crash the behavior of some of these companies became worse became absolutely appalling in some cases you you probably dealt with some absolutely disgraceful cases as i have um and pubs were closing and opening again lives were being ruined and, and pubs were being shut for for good as a result um and that of course is something that then gets through to mps people write to them they also notice themselves they like to go for um you know a, a pint or a sunday lunch as as most people do and that then started to lead to pressure and, and there was a huge battle really propaganda battle um facing the big pub companies and their association the the bbpa pbpa who said oh no it's nothing to do with uh, our companies our members it's nothing to do with the tie it's all to do with beer duty which of course is, is rubbish beer duty um is a is a producer tax um you know lower beer duty helps brewers but it doesn't have a direct impact on pub closures the way that that they were suggesting yeah. and in the end really it was the power of campaigning and as as you know ian you were one of the founders with me in the fair deal of your local campaign it was the first time really that, um you know people came together it, it was in my time the fair pint campaign that started it all and did, did a great job but it was when we all came together all the organizations who cared I set up the Parliamentary Save the Pub group in 2009 um, and the, the Select Committee were incredible, the Business Select Committee under their various different departmental names. They really looked at this, they really did scrutiny and they got to the bottom of it and published damning reports which were hard then for government to ignore. Government still tried to ignore it because that's what government does and you know, I'm afraid uh, it doesn't matter who's in power but the, the civil service is generally pretty reluctant to any kind of um, change any any significant change, um, particularly to to industry, but in the end, the the, the force of, of views, the force of campaigning, led to enough MPs really realizing that some reform was essential, or this would carry on, and people would continue being exploited. But in terms of your your second question as to what it was supposed to do, it's actually incredibly simple. I get really angry about this because 
we don't have what was intended by Parliament. And as you know, that's actually been confirmed to us in person. And Absolutely. What, what, what was asked for was incredibly simple, not very um, radical. It was simply to say that the, that the tenants of the large companies, and we originally defined those as being any company with 500 or more pubs that had um, tied and tenanted pubs, um, that they, those tenants should have the right to an independent rent assessment, an independent one by an independent adjudicator. And then what we asked for was in night, within 90 days, they would have the right to then pay that rent only. So it would be a market rent, a genuine market rent, independently assessed on the current trading conditions, etc. And they would then pay that going forward on the same terms in every other way. That's what we intended. Um, very simple. Um, and of course, that isn't what we got. The government then watered it down through the, the pubs code. Um, and then, as we know, unfortunately, we've got a um, an adjudication system that isn't really an adjudication system at all. We don't have an adjudicator. We have an arbitrator and someone who occasionally will make comments on things. And that is not an adjudicator. Um, so we don't have what's intended. It was amazing we got what we did and we need to strengthen that. We need to push hard to make that work better than it is but we still also i think need to push for some changes to the pubs code and possibly even to the legislation to actually go back and get what we were promised and let's remember we were promised fair and lawful dealing we were promised that um, the tied tenant should be no worse off than the equivalent free of tied tenant we don't have either of those things still and of course during the current crisis it's getting worse so worse so Lots of campaigning to do, but what we what we what we wanted and what Parliament in, intended was very simple: a simple independent um, rent assessment and the right to pay that rent only. And we don't have that. No, and, and I guess that that was a crucial thing for me. And you explained it very. You've explained it to me in the past. And I thought that was why it was good to revisit it here. It, it was that. It was that rebalancing. It was the level playing field. It took some of the if if, if the pub company behaves properly then you don't need to go for a market rent only option, but it gives you that option as a bit of leverage to, to, to level the playing field and get rid of some of this bad business practice. And as you said, that, that very clearly, I understand it as a layman, that that was what was intended and it just hasn't happened, hasn't it? Which I suppose leads us into, you know, Christ, we're four years into now the pub code. And as you say, the, the, the PCA who we have found out is, is an arbitrator, not a regulator. I mean, has it has it has it made any useful difference, or, or, or are we still in a bit of a pickle with all of this? Um, I mean, I think it, it, it's better to have it than not have it. Let, let's yeah. be clear on that. Um, but you know, in some ways, the best people to answer that are people like yourselves and uh, mm. and, and, and Dave um, Mountford, who you know, yeah. obviously we're going to speak to in in a minute, because you know you you are the people, the British Pub Confederation organisations who actually support tenants directly are the people who are experiencing the reality of the pubs code. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think it's better that we, we have it. It's better that there's some right. Um, mm. And of course, you know, you know, one of our colleagues on the British Pub Confederation steering group, Paul Crosman, who runs two fantastic free houses um, and one tied pub now with Star Bar and Pubs. Heineken used to be Punch Taverns. Well, he, of course, went through the process and he managed to get a free of tie agreement um but it wasn't a real market rent only option agreement at all it wasn't a real market rent it was a rent set by the pub company so you know he, he couldn't have gone through that process and other tenants who've done it couldn't have gone through that process but they are not coming out with uh, on, a, on a market rent only agreement not at all they're coming out with a free of tie agreement on a rent that is initially set by the pub code you might be able to knock it down a little bit but you also will have some terms in there that are unreasonable and one of the most disappointing things is there was supposed to be no discrimination against people against tenants who did decide to take their statutory right their legal right to go for a market rent only to go for a free of tie option and of course that happens because suddenly they have to pay um, upfront quarterly invoices um, and the terms are very different and you know we wrote at the time to the adjudicator saying well you can't allow this this clearly breaches the intent of the legislation uh, and of course, I'm afraid it was then the previous adjudicator, Mr. Newby, um, who, you know, 
we we regarded as conflicted all the way through and you know his performance frankly was was dreadful in his in his tenure and he, he didn't do anything he ignored it as he ignored just about everything that we sent through to him because you know clearly um, not this no discrimination means that you should be simply on the same terms and, and as you've said if these tied arrangements were were good if these worked for people then people would would look at the the equivalent rent they would say okay well i could pay this much rent or i can pay this much rent and this much for beer or i can pay a market rent um, and buy my product anyway deal direct with all the fabulous independent brewers and suppliers but of course the reality is that the tie as operated by these large companies is skewed the combination of the, the the dry rent the actual rent they pay and the wet rent is massively massively more than what a market rent genuinely should be which is why we need independent assessments and why unfortunately that's not what is happening so yes it, it, it's it's frustrating it is very frustrating um and you know we, we've got a lot to do but it's better that we have something and we do need to keep that in place we need to make sure that the government doesn't quietly decide that actually we don't need it because i mean one of the dangers is that the pub companies and their trade body could say oh well no, not many people are taking this uh, this market rent only option that people said was so important and of course we you know we need to say very strongly we don't have a genuine market rent only option it's been deliberately made far too difficult it's been put into a process that doesn't work that allows the pub company to object to anything and then go to arbitration and some of those arbitrations if you know have taken you know well over a year um, yeah. So, you know, it, it, it doesn't work. You know, we, we need to fight really hard. Um, and, you know, you remember we were all involved in the Fair Deal for your local campaign. Um, that's something that, that we will, after the COVID crisis, really need to start pushing again because we need that simple right, the simple right within 90 days to say, OK, um, I want an independent assessment. And within 90 days time, I'm paying that. And I'm just paying that. And nothing else in my lease is going to change because that and nothing else is the genuine market rent only option? Yeah, because I, th I think that that's and, and it's that the clues in the name market rent only. And I think you'd probably agree with me. I'd argue that any of these deals that have been announced as MRO uh, as a market rent only option aren't that. They're a variation on the existing agreement, but there's some kind of buying tie in them. So they're not market rent, rent only as Parliament intended. And I think that that's very clear. I also think. From our point of view, looking at it, um, not only are there the same bad business practices that were there before the code came in, but actually many of the regulated pub companies have invented a whole new range of bad business practices to get around the code. And it also brings us, I think, to a point that you and I are very firmly in agreement with, which is government and the regulator are not talking to the true voice of tenants they're talking to people who in many cases have some involvement or some reliance on the large pub companies for their income they're tied to them in some way and um, and i think one thing that you and i well in fact i know this i don't have to ask you i already know because we did what we did we saw that really the true voice of tenants wasn't being heard so as a result we both set up in recent times i think it's worth explaining to people the british pub confederation already existed the, the the forum of private business that i was part was a member of that there was there was lots of organizations under part of that but we felt we needed a bit more and as a result both of us <laughs> took action and i suppose it, it'd be worthwhile maybe you explaining about the campaign for pubs that you set up why you did it and then maybe i'll do the same about the uh, about the forum just so people are clear about what we're doing and what we're trying to achieve if that's okay yeah yeah of course i'd be delighted and i think i think it's been a a, a really great couple of weeks or so for for campaigning um, and for representation of, of licensees all licensees not just tenants um, and i think you know as you've said we needed to organize 
Um, you remember how powerful the Fair Deal for Your Local campaign was because those organisations came together. Um, I chaired it. We we organised it really effectively. Um, and, and that then gave us the inspiration to say, well, if it's worked for, for that, then surely we need to have that voice going forward. So that was why in 2015, as the pubs code was was being drafted or was, you know, um, shortly about to come in, we formed the British Pub Confederation to keep a permanent body, a permanent confederation of organisations representing pubs, publicans and pub campaigners together. Um, but but of course, you know, that's a confederation. So in, in, in a sense, it doesn't have any resources. It's not, a, it's not an organisation on its own. It's a confederation for when we agree and when we speak together, as we did in our letter um, to bees just, just the other day. Um, so I think the decision that that I made, having discussed this with quite a few people, including yourself, is that we needed a, a mass membership group alongside the Confederation. Because actually through the, you know, both of us through this awful crisis with pubs struggling, we've both had phone calls. We've had probably phone calls in a different way. You and Dave have had lots and lots of people saying, listen, can you help? Um, and, you know, that you've obviously set up this powerful new vehicle, which, you know, great name for British pubs to, to really ensure that you can then represent your members and fight for those members in individual cases, which is so important. I had lots of people, some licensees, some passionate pub campaigners, camera members, all sorts of people saying, look, we need to do something um, and actually saying, could I join the Confederation? I like what you're doing. I like what you're saying. You're the you're the you know, the strong voice. Um, and then, of course, you know, Ed, Anderson, Dave set up the, the No Pub, No Rent campaign, which then gave new impetus to, to campaigning and started to, to show that when people speak together, um, in that case, licensees speak together, it can be very, very powerful. So we realised that there was a need then to set up a mass membership group so that we could get publicans, pub campaigners like me, um, and, and and pub customers um, all all together in a mass membership group sitting alongside the confederation of which we're you know very much part of so that was what we're doing so we you know we it's only 25 pounds a year to, to join that and be part of it and all the campaign for pubs will do is campaign that's it we will campaign and represent we will work very closely with the forum of british pubs and all the british pub confederation organizations but it allows everyone who cares about pubs to to get involved and work with us so that's what we that's what we want to happen we've had a very good start when he launched a week ago um and and, you, and we want that to continue so i think it's very exciting i think if we have a very very strong um campaign group that everyone can join with with thousands of members and then we also have a very strong representative body um actually directly fighting and offering support to to licenses i think we've got a great combination and then through the confederation with all our partner organizations in there you know very important to remember the scottish license trade association in scotland who do a great job um, north of the border are members of the British Pub Confederation. So all those organisations and the Confederation will continue to campaign together. But I think now we have two very strong um, new organisations that allow everyone to get involved in different ways and offer, um, you know, increased support for licensees who need that. So I, th I think it, I think it's really exciting time. We, we now just have to make make them both work, which I think we will. Um, and then together, you know, we will be we'll be kicking down that door and making sure that we are heard in in Whitehall um, and in Westminster because that hasn't happened. But I think now, finally, we have the the ability to do that with our new organisations in place. Yeah, that that that's a, a good explanation. Of that I suppose I I just add to it. So the Forum of British Pubs came from. Um, I suppose it's fairly simple in, in, in the story in that I'd started working, or sorry, the former private business had started working a lot more closely with Dave. Um, and Dave Mountford and I were looking at lots of individual cases. Um, as you said, oh, pretty grim, some heartbreaking stuff in there. But part of it that Dave and I realised was we were dealing with things when the crisis had already happened. And while great we want to continue to do that we were saying oh well, hang on a minute is the stuff we can do at the front end to stop this happening in the first place so it was getting advice and information to people and then there was that realization that i suppose should be fairly obvious um but it's only when you think about it a, a lot of the bad business practices a lot of stuff that's gone on with big pubcos has relied 
on individual tenants being on their own and not having the information. I use the word ignorant in the right way, you know, just not knowing what's going on and what they're faced with and actually believing who they think of their partner. Their partner comes in and tells them they've got 80 grand's worth of dilapidations. Or, by the way, when you sign this contract, although we've seen the trade go down from 240 barrels to 70 barrels over the years, you're signing a contract and coming in, and you're going to be doing 280 barrels a year and not understanding the documentation to question that. So it was about information, training, guides, templates, a lot of the stuff that the forum private business did for their general business members and really focusing that on, on pubs. So yeah, that 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 really I suppose without waffling on too long is what we what we are trying to do and we'll bring out the films and the guidance. And I think it complements what we're doing. It doesn't contradict them in any way um, and as you say the confederation is, is the glue that holds it together so hopefully people understand a little bit better now what it is that we're, we're you know that we're trying to do and why we set them up um, and if you're happy with it i think it might be a good time now to kind of ask i know dave's got some of the questions that have come in from um, from our various members. So maybe get Dave to ask us both, and hopefully between the brains trust that is you and I, we'll be able to we'll be able to answer them. Yeah, sure. Let's so let's have some questions. Okay, Jeff, well, can, you, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, hey, fine. Great. Right. Yeah. Right, okay, so we've had a number of questions from members come through, um, and the first one's come from Neil Day, and he said, uh, "Could you ask the gentleman to 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 give give their opinion on the uh, the the COVID nineteen uh, crisis uh, has or has not been considered to be an MRO trigger, when um, clearly on the on the face of it, it falls under the description uh, in the pubs code." I know um, we've already done a bit of work on that, Ian. So I don't know if you want to take that one. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, yeah. I, if I, if Greg doesn't, I'll, I'll so I'll, I'll come in at, at first. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, it, first of all, it's worth saying I think the piece that the, the regulator, the pubs code adjudicator, has come out and said that COVID isn't a trigger for MRO. Um, I don't know whether we'd agree with that between Greg and I. I, I, I suspect. The, the one area that, that it seems to be based on is this thing that it, it, it impacts on the whole of the industry in the UK, UK and Wales. Um, I suppose you could argue that at any one time there's a whole load of the pub estate that's empty, that's shut down and it's not impacting on them. So I think that might be the point that you could argue that with the PCA. Um, so it'd take. I think it'd take a legal argument. I don't know if Greg agrees with that. With the PCA to, you know, to overturn that and say actually it is a trigger. I think the other thing that'll be interesting is, even if COVID nineteen in itself isn't a trigger, I would imagine that a lot of the impacts after COVID nineteen, business closures, things going on around the business environment around pubs may well be but greg might have something to to say about that as well yeah um and i think really this goes back to what i was saying earlier the 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 spirit the intent of the legislation was very clear um and that was that if suddenly there was a, a significant factor that affected trade that if trade um you know had a had a a, a significant drop then that would be a trigger for the the tenant to to request the market rent only option and get the independent assessment. So, you know, in terms of what was intended and what what mm. would, would have been expected by all the MPs who who understood and voted that through, is that this absolutely should be. I think what's interesting is that, you know, you could say in the case of um, a, a company that that not charging rent, so Admiral were not charging rent. Well, I would say there's no, there's obviously no trigger then. Um, at that stage, because there is there is nothing, so you'd have to look at whether uh, once rent is being charged again or trade starts, that that then would be the trigger. But certainly, you know, where you've got rent being charged on pubs that are not even trading, um, then then how can that not be a time to look at the whole thing and get a get a, a rent review? I mean, one thing that that we we put out yesterday, and uh, the campaign for pubs has just launched a ten points to save pubs because obviously with our wider remit of campaigning we're looking at everything including things like planning um planning law to to better protect pubs 
And one of the things that we call for in there is actually a statutory right to a rent review for all tenants now. You know, trade has changed. The pub industry has changed out of all recognition because of this crisis. Everyone now needs to say, well, my rent was based on before. My rent was based on normal times. You cannot possibly say now that my rent and my terms should be the same. So I do find it really disappointing the way uh, the current pub's code adjudicator, and we will have to work with her, Ian, and, and try to persuade her to, to take strong action. But you know, from the experience that we've had, she she looks very much at the law as it's drafted and then says, well, this is my interpretation of it. She seems to pay no attention, actually, to what was actually intended. Um, and, you know, if if as I as she's admitted, if this is not what was intended, then frankly, she should, should be able to say that she'd say, well, I can't do that because the law was drafted poorly or the pub's code is weak. But I do understand that that is what was intended because very, very clearly under the current situation, everyone should be getting the right to have a proper rent review, look at their terms, look at the time pricing as well, um, g- given that option to, to change their, their leases and their tenancies because everything has changed and therefore you know, rent absolutely has to change to reflect that. And I think of our voices on any, co- you know, the PCA spoke to obviously the regulated pub companies and spoke to two or three organisations who you and I know are connected and reliant in some way on the, the, those pub opera, you know, the, those regulated pub companies and made a decision. And again, I think it's a very good example of where the true voice of tenants wasn't heard. Um, and that may well have, 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 have changed the decision, but it was very easy for them to do what they do, bearing in mind who they consulted with. Um, yeah. Dave... Uh, another question, please. Yes, yeah, certainly. So, um, James Urquhart, who has been a very, uh, very uh, supportive uh, member of the, of, the, of the team and has done a lot of work with his, uh, his MP, um, has asked the question regarding support packages from specifically Stonegate. Um, we, we asked if there could be some leeway, i.e. instead of paying 100% of rent, as Stonegate are currently asking for, and then giving either 75% or 50% into the trade accounts, could we not just pay the 25% and keep the rest in our bank accounts to help alleviate our cash flow worries going forward? Yeah. Do you want to pick up on that one, Greg, first? Or? Well, I mean, I think it's a question to EI Group and Stonegate, but, I mean, all I'll really say is just what a disgrace. What a, what a swizz to be... You know, claiming this is some sort of credit. Um, as you know, Ian, we put out a press release specifically on yes. this um, a couple of weeks back, I think, which is on the British Pub Confederation website. You know, I, I, and I said that, and I'm glad to say that. Yet, you know, it's been great the way um, that because of the the, the intervention that, that Anthony Brown, um, the, the MP, actually wrote the letter, got lots of other MPs, and I spoke to Anthony Brown's office after that. So that does show how great it is when we have strong licensees on the ground campaigning with us um and and you know his office understood his office understood that that offer when it came through um was phony because it was based on artificial tide pricing it's very easy you know if i if i say to, to you you know here's a can of baked beans it cost me 30p but i'm charging you um 60p but actually what i'm going to do is i'm going to i'm going to be really helpful i'm only going to charge you 50p you know that's not that's not credit at all. It's just you know tinkering with their own um, markup. On it's it's a disgrace. So you know the answer should be first of all that actually they shouldn't be charging rent on pubs, commercial rent on pubs that are closed at all. But I think the the key thing is that we need to keep pushing this and keep pushing that this is phony and make sure that MPs understand this isn't support. These aren't concessions. Um, this is just a, a a clever ruse to make sure that. Um, the EI Group and Stonegate, um, who of course are based in the Cayman Islands tax haven, um, that they get the money that was intended from the government to support pubs. That actually it goes into Stonegate's bank account, EI's bank account. Um, that's that that leaves a very nasty taste in the mouth, and I think it it really shows an awful lot of what is wrong in the pub sector. And of course, that's exactly what you know we're all trying to change. 
Yeah, I, I mean, the only thing I, I, I suppose I'd add to that is, and it confirms what you say, you're not telling me that the buyers within these big organisations aren't going to be getting products, you know, based on what's gone on with COVID. They're going to be paying less for what they are. Oh, times are hard, you know, we, we closed down. They'll be paying less. So they're not really passing on any discount to, to, yeah. to, to the tenants. And, and the other one is, you know, we, we've seen that people can behave. I mean, to be fair to Admiral, Admiral announced that they weren't going to take rent for three months before any of the campaigning started off. They did the right thing, as did many of the family brewers. Um, it, it, so it really does highlight the fact that those, you know, huge investment company owned companies are, are basically their landlords. The, the, the fact that their properties happen to sell beer is a complete matter of indifference to them. They're, 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 they're property companies. And I think that probably answers a lot of the questions around the the, the rent the rent issues. Dave, do you have a, another another question for Well, James, James, um, has, uh, James Urquhart has asked another question, which is probably a very, very similar answer, but it'd be worth expanding on. Why has there been no indication of any kind of support when we do actually open? Surely this could have been a big weight off people's minds, knowing what they have had to face going forward. Yeah, um, and, and I think James is absolutely right. So much of this is wrong. The, the way the government are listening only to the voices of the the big pub companies um, and other associations who have wider interests and indeed are linked to the pub companies um, shows that really individual licensees are, are not being heard. Licensees groups are not being properly heard in those discussions, and that's obviously what we are what we're trying to do. And I'll, you know, and I'll say a big congratulations to James to get his MP listening, and that's crucial. And going forward, we need. Um, our excellent licensees to go to their own MPs and, and explain again exactly as we did, Dave. You'll remember how crucial it was telling MPs the truth about this business model and the behaviour. And they didn't believe it at first, many of them, but they oh, started to. They started to when they when they did it themselves. But there has to be support going forward. There should be real support from the companies themselves, and that isn't being offered. And I think that you know they're desperate to get pubs back open, not because they care about pubs because then they can justify full rent. The rent. And, as you, and as you know, they're already phoning publicans up and saying, order beer now. And people are saying, well, we don't even know if we're open. Um, but the government also have a role. Uh, you know, my, my view is, you know, this is an awful situation for so many businesses. It's difficult for the government. It's very challenging. But my view is if the government, if the state makes it illegal for a legal business to trade, I think the government has a legal as well as a moral responsibility to support that business. And, uh, you know, I know there's been a lot of support for for many businesses so far. That's very welcome. But you're right. Trade will be restricted. You know, even if we still don't know about the 4th of July, we still don't know about the social distancing measures um, and all the rest of it. But clearly trade will be a fraction of what it should be and probably for some time. And therefore, the companies and the sector, you know, rent should reflect that, absolutely. But also the government, because the government are making it illegal for people to trade normally, I think they have responsibility. And I would just say, if people want to pop to the Campaign for Pubs website to see our 10-point plan across the sector, um, we have put in there a suggestion of 5% VAT for 12 months, for example, ways to actually help pubs directly. So we do need that. And if we all campaign for those things, as well as, you know, hammering the big pub companies for their behaviour and telling the adjudicator, frankly, to pull the finger out, stop just picking up the phone to the pub compliance office and think that does the job. It doesn't. There has to be changes now. There must be changes to rent um, and to the, the tied pricing for for those tenants to survive and we need support for all pubs all licensees freehold free houses the lot to get through this and if we care about pubs you know it's very easy for government to say oh i care about pubs. very important british pubs um, if they do it they need to support that they need to support the pub in this unparalleled um, era to make sure that we have not just pubs but that important pub culture so vital to communities going forward yeah, I, I, the only thing I'd add to that, agree completely, is I think the what they do need to look at is these guidelines that we were told were due out on the 13th of June. We've still not seen them. Uh, maybe that reflects the argument that's going on between two metre and one metre spacing. But no publican 
is able to make any decision at the moment, being binary or anything else, until they know the parameters of which they're working with. And government have got to get those guidelines out as quickly as for anybody to make a sensible decision whether A, they can open safely, first and foremost, for their workers and for their customers. And secondly, is it economically viable to open? Because in the guidelines, if we can only get six people through the door at any one time, fully staffed up, I'm actually better off short and and those the, the delay on the guidelines i think on top of what greg said is, is is very important i think we've probably got time for one more question um dave and then we're going to have to um have to wrap this up so if, if you could fire one more what i would say is if there are any questions that have come through or come through later that we haven't managed to deal with now between greg and i we'll speak to each other and we'll make sure that they're answered in writing. Like, yeah, we, we, we do that between us. Yeah, and we can do it again as well. Yeah, time. well, that's true. We can come on. That, that That's very true. We can do another session. So, Dave, we'll take one more from you, if, if we may. OK, well, well, the, well, there are only two more individuals who have asked questions. And, and Andy Whiteman asks, do you think the introduction of the pub's code and its adjudicator has been a success? Uh, and I think you've answered that one already. Um, but Car Caroline Walker-Smith has, has asked a, a number of questions, but I'll condense them basically into, into one. Um, what can be done? She's a Punch Taverns tenant. What can be done about the full rent being charged by Punch? Um, as this, the, the answer to this question will, will determine whether she walks away after 14 years. Um, and if she does walk away, uh, will she be chased uh, for the debt by Punch Taverns? Yeah, well, Do you want to take that one in first, or shall I? Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, I, I suppose, yeah. The, um, all, all we can really do with, with Punch, well, we can keep talking to the individual company, we can keep talking to government about this issue about rent that we've kind of discussed before, um, but it is a shocking state of affairs where some people are being put in a, in a state of complete financial jeopardy purely based on the fact that the pub companies are still taking rent off them when they have no income coming through the door whatsoever. Unfortunately, the question about, you know, can they chase after her if she, well, yes, unfortunately they can if she's in, con, if she's in a contract with them. So we've got to do everything that we possibly can to make sure that she survives in that business and that holds her. We don't want to see any publicans being put under this kind of pressure and the kind of protection that Greg spoke about and, and driving that through with government, that's what we've got to really make sure happens, that people aren't put in this position where they're being put out of business purely based on the fact that a very greedy pub company is still taking rent off them. And and, and, and I think that, that kind of sums up my response to that one. I don't know if Greg's got anything he'd like to, to add. Yeah, I mean, just to say, you know, it, it makes my blood boil. Um, this is why we, we do this in the end. This is why we campaign, why we care. We care about pubs. But we're also horrified at the, the injustice. And it is an injustice. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's such an unfair model. It's so skewed in favour of these large companies that however you look at it, they, you know, they, they don't lose. And people often say, oh, well, you know, surely it's not in their interest for pubs to fail. But people need to see now of course it's in their interests um if they're managing to charge thousands of pounds of rent on a closed pub and then if someone walks away um they'll just get someone else in they'll get someone else in later in the year that's how it works that's that's yeah. the churn and that's how that, that, that's the, the complete lack of morality at the heart of the, the, this this model as operated by some of these big companies um so you know i think the key thing is that you know, licensees do need representation, representation, they do need support, and it's better to have that before these things happen. It's better to do it now rather than when it's too late. So, you know, as you said earlier, Ian, people should, you know, look at the, at, at the package that's offered and say, OK, well, I need representation. I need to be part of something that will then give me, give me back up and give me a voice and have people assisting me when I have these problems because there's going to be lots of people in those situations now. And, you know, that's why coming together is, is really so important. Yeah, I agree. I think, you, you know, you've hit, you've hit on something there that I think is, is, is very important for people to understand. A lot of those pub companies will be looking at four and a half million unemployed people as an opportunity um, to replace... You know, tenants in the pubs and bring you know fret 
I was going to say fresh meat to the grind. That's a horrible way of putting things, but that's exactly what they're doing to people. Um, and that's why we're going to have to make sure that those new, because there are going to be new people coming in that are really well informed and know, know what's going on. Um, and, and make no mistake that a lot of those big regulated pub companies will be looking at that as an opportunity. Uh, and that's a terribly sad state of affairs. Um, I'd like to, well, I think that seems like a good place to finish off. Obviously, if you if you get a chance, if, you, if you're looking at this video at a later stage, please do look at the websites for both um, the campaign for pubs and for the Forum of British Pubs. There's lots of good information on there. We're there to help. That's what Greg and I are trying to do. I'm sure we'll repeat this exercise again, again, Greg. I'd love to. We never have enough time, but I think keeping these to bite-sized pieces that people can watch is quite important. So thanks very much for your um, your input and your insight. I think that's been really useful. I thoroughly enjoyed it. We should do it again. Yeah, a bit of pleasure. Thanks to all who asked questions. Um, thanks, and thanks to everyone who's doing their bit to help You know, the campaigning that we're all involved in. Let, let's keep it going. Let's get as many licensees campaigning together as possible and then we'll be an even stronger voice and that's what we need to be going forward absolutely greg thank you very much indeed cheers in good to speak